Hello everyone and welcome back. Welcome back to another YouTube video. Welcome back to another malware analysis video. Seemingly uh, everyone's favorite kind of video that I've been doing lately. So uh, let's dive into this one. I think this one is going to be a lot of fun. I'm pretty excited to bring this to you. Uh, I will add a little disclaimer and note I have already ran through this, but trust me, this is jam packed with a lot of good stuff. So let's dive into it. I'll hop over to my computer screen here. Uh, I am running in my Ubuntu Linux VM. Some of you might be scratching your head like, John, what the heck? You got a little Kali Linux dragon here. Uh, aren't you running Kali? No, it's just the wallpaper for the clickbait. That's, that's all we do here. We just, we just feed the YouTube algorithm. That's all I know how to do. So I'll open up my command line here. And I have a directory created called HTA. And in this directory, I've got some files, like a little JSON file for some registry contents that we'll get into, and a wacko.hta. That is not the original name of the file. Uh, I didn't want to end up doing that because there are going to be some things that will be mentioned in this video uh, about, hey, some folks. Uh, but there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing in that. It's just the name of the file. But you'll notice the .hta extension. Now, if you aren't familiar, if you aren't aware, if you don't know, etc., uh, an HTA extension is an HTML application. It's literally taking HTML, the regular markup language, a hypertext markup language, right? The HTML acronym and giving it some superpowers so that it can run code, not just act as a decoration or the language that will help you structure documents in HTML, the markup language, but it gives it some other flexibility so that it can actually execute stuff. So the little, little little blurb here that Google will give us, it's an HTML application for Microsoft Windows program that source code consists of HTML, dynamic HTML, and one or more scripting languages supported by Internet Explorer, like Visual Basic Script or JScript. HTML is used to generate the user interface, but the scripting language is used for program logic. So it's spicy. There's some good stuff in there. You might actually see uh, HTA files often used for like ransomware notices. Uh, so that is its own can of worms that we won't dive into. And this one is admittedly not a ransomware notice, but take a look at this one. <laughs> we have our work cut out for each other, ladies and gentlemen. This one should be, uh, this should be a ton of fun. So I guess we can start by cleaning this thing. Uh, you guys know me. I tend to just try and save a copy of this so I have the original. And I'll go through it and like try and add in my own, like manually going through it, carving through the code to add an indentation and beautifying it, trying to make sense of the variables, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and some folks have asked me, John, what are you doing? Why are you wasting your time? You're an idiot. And I tell them, I know, I know, I am an idiot. Uh, you could just be using an online tool like a beautifier. And you're totally right. Uh, that would make this significantly faster. Now I say, hey, I like to use this time while I'm going through and manually beautifying the code to like actually get a, a sense of what the program is doing, like what the code actually does. It's weird. I don't know. Like washing dishes. It, it, it builds character, you know? You could just run it in the dishwasher, but <laughs> there's something about it. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we will use an online beautifier for this just to kind of speed us along because there's a lot to unpack here. You'll notice that this is just going to end up being a, a chunk of JScript, a chunk of JavaScript, and uh, that's it. So we'll pass this to a JavaScript beautifier online. Maybe that takes some fun out of working through it, but trust me, we're going to dive into some good stuff in just a moment. So let's fire up another web browser. Let's Google for a cheeky JavaScript beautifier. Beautifier. And let's grab, yeah, beautifier.io. Scroll down, dump in the code here. It's all one massive line. Click on that beautify code button and now it's a little bit more sane and sensible. Not a lot, but a little, so. All right, oof, oof. Uh, that lost some of the indentation, so I'm just going to select it all and tab it through. I think that's as far as we need. Yeah. Okay, cool. Nice. So here we are. Here we are with our neat little JScript or JavaScript uh, rendition. And I've said this many times in the past. If you aren't familiar with JScript and kind of the different differentiation between it and JavaScript, it's basically JavaScript. Not going to lie. It, it, it's essentially JavaScript, but it can run on your host because Windows 
the little Microsoft dialect, their rendition of JScript, uh, this iteration or sort of rendition of JavaScript is a high performance scripting language designed to create active online content for the World Wide Web. JavaScript allows developers to link and automate a wide range of objects and web pages, including ActiveX object control and Java programs. Again, Google's blurb here. Yes, it's used in Microsoft Internet Explorer and it's implemented in the active scripting engine. So you might see objects like an active X object that allow you to do things with the Windows operating system and on that host, on that computer. So now that we know what we're looking at, let's try and make sense of this thing. Um, we're in this cleaned file name, so I don't think there's a whole lot to do uh, other than dive through it. We have this start of seemingly a registry key, HKCU for HK, H key current user, uh, and the software little subfolder there, little key. Now that variable has a random name, but it's used in the very, very next variable to just concatenate some strings together. So I don't think this is used anywhere else. Nope, <laughs> it's not. So we can just kind of grab that and, and put it right there. Really easy. We don't need those semicolons or those concatenation because we can make sense of what it is and what it's doing. And then we have some other wonky stuff going on. You'll notice they're using a backslash X to denote a, a character. 68 does lend us in the range of ASCII characters. So while this looks like a byte, it looks like a hexadecimal thing, it's still gonna end up evaluating to a regular like printable character. Adds in an FI and adds in a list or an array. Now I see the structure a lot. There are a lot of variables or some syntax that's just a list, it's just an array, but they index one specific part of it, which is weird. Uh, and then, I, I, I don't know, it's just adding extra noise, adding extra chaos, stuff to avoid that antivirus stepping in or preventative security measures from automatically detecting this. So it tries to hide. This is the artifact that was left on the computer touching the file system. So they're gonna be a little stealthy. They're gonna try and be clever. Now, because they're using this syntax to just grab a character from this list or from this array, uh, we can honestly, and because it's just simple like string concatenation, we can probably carve this out and determine what that value is going to be. Now I'll go through this. I'll try and move pretty quick because it's probably pretty boring to look at, but because it's node, because it's JScript, uh, did I open up another terminal? Yeah, I did. We can just run it locally kind of server side on Linux in Node or using Node.js. Now, if you get to the portion and fragment of JScript code that is specific to Windows, like creating those ActiveX objects or working with WScript and WMI and things like that, uh, that obviously won't work. It won't run in Linux. That's part of the reason why I do some of my analysis in Linux because yes, I'm more familiar with it. I enjoy it. I like being in Linux. It's also because I'm not gonna accidentally detonate some portions of the malware. Now I say that and I'll totally go into a Windows VM and throw stuff in there anyway, but you know, you know me. So let's slap this in and this will just churn out what that variable is gonna end up being set to. Uh, I went through this in kind of an iterative process and just messed with it. So. I will try and cruise through that so you really see the same thing. Uh, and maybe I'll go ahead and clean up and edit this video so there's a quick, like, speedy time lapse or something. I like this one, it's a, it's a good old F variable. <laughs> Can I get an F in the chat? F in the comments? Okay, so I finished kind of going through just determining what those values might be as as strings. Did I lose one up at the top here? Oh, I, I guess I removed that one for the registry key and didn't end up nerfing it. Um, but you'll notice that none of these are really all that useful. None of them mean anything or do anything that doesn't look like base 64 and some other kind of encoding that I it would recognize. Now that doesn't mean, however, that these are just complete nonsense. Maybe later down in the code, this these variables will be used maybe to just index a specific letter or get some characters or substrings and slices of it. So I'm gonna keep them. Uh, we could try and rename them to like what their contents are. But for now, I, I'm just gonna kind of leave it and keep cruising along. This next segment of code looked really weird to me because it, it, it runs a 
try statement that'll try to evaluate code or do something, but it instantly throws an error. Uh, and it, it, it catches this error and it uses a try catch. And the catch will take in an argument, which I wasn't sure, is that gonna be like the exception type? Is that gonna be the error message? Uh, and then it tries to index that, like with square braces taking out portions of it. So I thought that was weird and odd, but these try statements aren't going to mean anything. They're just, again, more noise to trip over AV or whatever the case may be. And uh, then the catch code will actually run, but grab the value maybe out of these error messages. Uh, we can try this again in Node and just see how it looks and what it evaluates to. So I'll slap these in, but <laughs> you'll see it just kind of makes the period be the only thing that's actually returned out. So that's that, I guess. <laughs> we can try this over and over again, and again, slowly determine what it builds out, but you'll notice maybe there's a little bit of a pattern here. Uh, whatever is passed into that throw statement for the error inside of the try block, it grabs that and considers that to be the value of the variable that it's setting inside of the catch statement. So again, maybe this will be useful somewhere. Uh, I'll speed through this in the magic of video editing so you guys don't have to sit through me doing this song and dance. Okay, so now we're done with that segment. And again, now we just sort of have single letters, which isn't all that useful. Um, we may get to a point where all of this is practically useless. <laughs> Eventually we'll get to maybe a lower level or like a segment of the code that just kind of evaluates everything. In fact, that's probably pretty likely considering what this does next. Um, and maybe that's like, hey, John, you wasted your time here. And that's probably pretty valid. Uh, I still like to go through it when I can to get a better idea as to what the code is using or, or what variables might be in what. Like some of these maybe wouldn't evaluate out to a single letter or if it had something like more of a smoking gun or more of a telltale as to what was going on. So I, I wanted to go ahead and, and go through that. I'll, I'll still do this for kind of the other segments. And then they start to actually pull out some interesting JScript or JavaScript like constructs here. <laughs> I, maybe that was just part of my mind because this came from constructor as the string that it built out. Um, looks like these others might be doing something similar. I'll grab this variable. Let's see what we have here. Ooh, an eval statement. Eval to run more code, uh, P8SM8S is being set to the this object. Now the this object in JavaScript or JScript will like keep track of the instantiation of the code that's running. Like all kind of notions of functions or variables being set. Like you can literally see all of the variables that we've just defined are kept track in this object. This, this object. This, this object named that thing. <laughs> so uh let's let's again just take take that value uh i do want that and i neglected to copy paste it copy pasta let's see what this guy does Ooh, a w script dot shell so that will give us a little bit more functionality to do things specifically with windows that means that Maybe we'll actually will get to see some fireworks go off in this code after all. Um, let's go ahead and grab this next portion. I'm gonna make sure I get the full variable name because that way I want it still in the context of my node interpreter as I go through it and uh, in case it's used later on and node will return it out for me. So we get ActiveX object just as well as a string that this now code has built out the primitives for. So is it going to end up, oh, a reg read. Oh, okay. Do we end up using reg read? Now that they've built out all these string primitives to be able to do something, uh, and they're using those specific JScript uh, and uh, JavaScript kind of syntax, what will this do? I see an eval statement yet again. Another 
variable. We're almost at the end here. Oh, and this is close. We need to close some handle or something. What do we got here? LCT. What is that supposed to be for? <laughs> what is LCT supposed to be? Like part of select? No, that wouldn't make sense. This is being used though. This variable is kind of put into action right away. They take LCT and index it off the same thing? Oh, oh, off the constructor. What? How does that get a function out of that? LCT? LCT? Indexed with constructor? Oh, is that? Oh, that's super cool. So that's like the object, right? A string object. That could probably be like literally anything. Uh, let's throw in the classic here. Take the constructor and it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you get the constructor of the constructor, you just suddenly have a function that's super slick. Wow, they just pulled a function like out of thin air. Uh, let me take note of that. Uh, outlines a function. Maybe that's the best way to, to say that. Uh, and then they go ahead and use that variable in the very next one where they define a function based off of this guy. Ooh, and that was the eval. <laughs> so they make an anonymous function with that? Is that what they do? This guy, he exists in the context, doesn't he? No, 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 I didn't, I didn't define him. Let's grab that, slap it in. Uh, function. So let's not call this because I don't want to really execute that. But yeah, it makes an anonymous function. But if you were to execute it, it takes everything in this instance and stuffs it into this p8 sm8 variable let's let's do it like that's not going to be that's not going to be malicious at this point so that didn't return anything but now we should have a new magic variable because it's been evaluated and executed in the current context without explicitly creating this variable it has been now defined with all of the guts that this right this code and this object already pulled out so that's kind of cool and then we try with actual stuff that's happening here flgldh being defined as a new this object referenced or indexed with an active x object <laughs> is that right why is that not defined anymore circular what that will reference and get active x object and then it passes in a w script dot shell string argument so this essentially is going to be w script shell I think that's that's fair to say. So we get capability to do Windows things, and then we eval. You can see that up there. We run an, an, another eval statement with w script shell reg read. So we request a registry object on NALGNKD, which is the one that's defined up here. Aha. Okay, so we reg read that, get the contents, get the value. That's not like set, is it? It's not pulled into, how is that? Is that being saved or stored as a variable? Or is it just kind of like executed? It is evaled. Oh, they run close. Oh, no, 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 no. It is eval. They eval the reg read contents. So they're executing all of this out of the registry. The next next stage of this will come from the registry, right? Yeah. Okay. So just as kind of a, a nice benchmark, we successfully turned uh, this monstrosity... <laughs> 
<laughs> into this, which makes at least a little bit more sense. So I still, I think a good thing to do is to just figure out what's going on. And I didn't end up renaming a lot of variables in this one, but it's still kind of piecing through it what it really does. So let's keep cruising. We, uh, we have this registry file that I have uh, prepared and gotten ready for us. The uh, registry.json has some good data in it. This is a, a pull from the registry of that target and victim machine at this at this time. Um, and we went ahead to e examine as to what really was going to be pulled from this specific key. As you can see, that's the one that's referenced here and it pulls the data down and executes it. So the data here, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and grab, because this is in a JSON format and because it's wrapped in quotes and in a string, it might have some escape characters in it. So I'm just going to wrap that all in some output. And now I can grab the original portion of it. So we'll call this stage two.js. Still uh, JScript at this point, but since that is new code, let's try and beautify it here and let's see what we're working with. I will uh, probably save that as like stage two beautified, beautified. Good, good, good. Uh, let's slap that in there now and let's see what we're working with. Again, some indexing. It defines the, <laughs> the letter U Super exciting. Uh, let's store these just in case we need them. This one gets the letter N, which you could tell from just simply reading it, but I, I'm gonna copy paste uh, Frenzy right now, everybody. So don't, oh, I actually didn't see that one coming. <laughs> like I didn't expect that to turn into run. I just thought of the UN. So now we have R U N run. Now that variable, which is that R variable, which was not defined in this script is still pulling from the context of the original wacko thing here. So this VFR C4X0M, the one that's been defined as R. Oh, I just realized literally all of those were defined to be straight up nonsense and then reevaluated. <laughs> just make more noise, guys. Don't let the, don't let the EDR see you. So we get run, and then this was our wscript.shell, right? wscript.shell or wscript shell, grabbing the run function and then passing in some commands here, no, new syntax. Ooh, PowerShell. PowerShell's in the mix. Uh, scrolling all the way to the end. I see some commas here, which tell me that these are other arguments. So if I were to slap this entire like input here as if it were maybe mangling the, the string a little bit, I will run into a wall just like plopping this into Node.js because zero is going to end up being the return value from the very, very last element there. Like the, the comma is gonna kind of get in the way. So as you can see, that evaluates to zero, that the second argument evaluates to zero. So these are just kind of the arguments for uh, like no window. I think uh, when you pass those to run, it's like minified, minimize, no window, just try and be as, as stealthy or as quiet as you can. So let's just pass them as, as run. And now we have this PowerShell portion, which I'll grab all the way to the very, very end because I do see them doing some weird string stuff in there <laughs> yeah it's indexed out but i'm sure you being the smart person you are can see that that is just going to poop out uh powershell.exe enc for encoded yeah 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 so now we have another powershell payload now we have another stage yet again um, this is encoded just in simple base 64. So we can hop back over and try to base 64 decode this. I'm just going to spit it out into uh, standard output and pipe it to, I realize my pipe isn't visible because my big ugly face is in the way. I'll pipe that to base 64 with a B minus D. 
to decode it. Type D. Now we get this, which is kind of tiny, which is kind of small. Uh, but let's go ahead and define that as we have now a stage two. Uh, let's make a stage three. And now we're into PowerShell. We've broken out of some J script, but let's see what this thing is. Nice. Uh, let's clean or beautify this. Uh, I haven't found a good online PowerShell beautifier. Uh, I know there's one that you can run locally. There's like a DTW beautify script that you can download and work with. Uh, that truthfully, I, I, I don't think I have it installed on my Linux rendition of PowerShell right now, but anyway. This one was super small and super easy. We could just kind of do by hand. Uh, notice they have a, lots of random back ticks in here. Um, that back tick is typically used as an escape sequence or an escape character in PowerShell. Oftentimes you'll see like a backslash in other languages, like backslash N to denote a new line, backslash T to denote a tab. That's all done with an escape or back tick in PowerShell. But if you were to add in a back tick on a letter that doesn't need to be escaped, in certain cases, PowerShell like, doesn't care and it pretends they aren't there. So that's again, another kind of cheesy technique that could be used to hide and not make sure that, hey, stupid signature detection won't pick up on some of those um, blatant and egregiously bad code. So just nerfing out all of those back ticks. Looks like now we have reg being billed out as HKU. So again, the current user, UNX2M, that's the same reg path that we kind of saw earlier, but there's this whole other big thing here. Full reg is gonna end up doing a format string where we add in, looks like software, replacing some characters and, oh, there's another semicolon there. The expression will get item property and then there's an IEX. Ah, an invoke expression. IEX, kind of the PowerShell alias for invoke expression, which means that it will run and evaluate code on the fly. So it doesn't need to be written to disk. Uh, we have the full reg variable we could try and build out. Uh, I'll put node over at the top here. And now let's hop into PowerShell. I'm running PowerShell core in my Linux virtual machine. So if I just spit this in, it's not really gonna give me anything because these other variables aren't defined. I probably should have copied those in just as well. So let's go ahead and grab those. We'll take all of these strings here, pretty please. And full reg, we will determine to be, obviously I, I'm dumb, sorry. It's not gonna display it out anyway because it's just sending it to a variable in PowerShell. Won't return that out to you, so you have to examine it and take a look at it yourself. Uh, this is the registry key that is the same like location that we saw this thing to begin with and was referenced in that previous HTA file. Zero or O N X two M blah, blah, blah. But where is the key? Oh, that looks like that's built out in the expression. So the expression will get this registry key and add in the parameter or the param which we know is 71TX1QDVIS. Great. Um, and then using the format string that really isn't necessary if just to make uh, this confusing for a program, it's IEX or invoke expression, and it evaluates that out. So now we have uh, transformed and once again gone into the registry for this 71TX1 blah, blah, blah. Bringing us to stage four, right? Now in PowerShell. So again, I will go ahead and copy this out. Um, I will go take a look at this, uh, again, displayed out with quotes around it in case I accidentally have any um, specific, oh God, that's seizure inducing, Never mind. Never mind. please stop, please stop. All right, I'm killing that window. <laughs> Sorry, that was pretty bad. In case it has any, um, backslashes in it to escape out the strings. Let's not do that, actually. You know what? Maybe we can just kind of do it as we need to. Uh, we'll call that stage four dot PS1. And the line is so long that 
the syntax highlighting is not triggering on PowerShell. Uh, so let's call this stage four clean. Oh, but this looks like kind of the classic syntax where you just use a gzip compressed stream, base64 encoded to bundle up a whole nother payload. Uh, this is super common. We, I think we've seen this a lot. I'm, I'm sure segments of Cobalt Strike or any other uh, malware family or evasion framework thing will, will do this. Uh, this is pretty, pretty much a long PowerShell script. Uh, so we'll see what we get here. But down at the very, very bottom, you can see that we do decompress it with gzip. Was it gzip? Was it gunzip? Oh, deflate stream. Okay. And it reads to the end and passes it to a pipe where it invokes a another IEX. I'm assuming because it tacks in an X here. Oh, but this is kind of neat. I haven't seen a verbose preference variable kind of being used for building out IEX before. That's slick. They did one. Hello? Computer? One, two, three? Where, are you just not gonna display that out for me for some reason? <laughs> We could do it in Windows if we wanted to. You know what, let's think and do it. We'll get PowerShell in here. Ta-da. One. What? What? That's voodoo magic. Oh God, oh gosh, I'm sorry. Unexpected token? IEX, that's it, that's it, whatever. <laughs> IEX invoke expression uh, and it's piped to it. So obviously all of this will be unraveled and decoded and piped to run, but uh, we don't want that to detonate, right? So I'm actually just going to, to unravel this. I'm gonna call this like stage four nerfed or something. Uh, and let's go ahead and remove that invoke expression call because I don't want this thing to run. I don't want it to, to take off on me. I will use PowerShell, however, to go ahead and allow this thing to decode itself. Um, I need to be in the HTA file folder. There we go. So stage four, nerfed. If I hit enter on this, we'll spit out all of that deflated and decoded. <laughs> and now we have this. So um, I will, I think I can pass that to out file, right? Out file or pipe it to out file. That's PowerShell. Stage five dot PS1. Yeah. Stage five. Oh boy. Okay. We're in for a treat now. <laughs> this is huge. How big is this file? Look at look at the sidebar on the right in Sublime Text. How many lines is this? Almost a thousand. Almost a thousand. No big deal. We're only like thirty minutes into the video anyway. Who needs? Oh, why, why don't we go for another three hours? Um, what is up with this line? <laughs> it makes it a tes variable. That's just l k h j. What is that? It's just straight up. Tess. <laughs> Ooknib returns. That's a, that's a meme for any of uh, any other watchers of this channel. Ooknib was has has gone down in infamy as a a great malware analysis meme here. So they're running ad type. So add type will allow us to uh, automatically compile kind of inline C sharp code from within PowerShell. Add type does touch disk. It uses the csc.exe or kind of the command line rendition of the C sharp compiler. And that will leave some temporary files in the Windows temporary folder. You'll see them sometimes with a random name .0.cs or .0.out or .0.command line. Um, 
and that will that will touch disk that that will that is an indicator that add type was used uh, to compile C sharp on the fly. But that's very powerful, right? That gives PowerShell a lot more power <laughs> in that it can use like Win32 API calls as we're seeing right here, where we can load in some functions from other DLLs or other libraries. You can see that this grabs and pulls in the syntax to, oh, what do we got here? Virtual alloc, you know? Allocate some memory, load library, maybe load in a DLL or some more code, get proc address to dynamically look for addresses. Mem copy stuff in that shell code. Just put it in the buffer, protect the allocated memory, or maybe mark it as executable, right? Wait for a single object, just let it go and create thread. Obviously execute the thing. So PowerShell is certainly much more powerful when we can load in some of that. Uh, and that's C-sharp in line within PowerShell. Then we do this thing, which is just a rainbow of a format string um, with a lot in here. Let's, uh, let's, let's turn word wrap on for that one. Take a look at it with the magnifying glass. <laughs> I see a couple of semicolons in here so this is like a this is a multi-line thing can i just take this and put it into a different window so that way i can remove these new lines yeah da, 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 da. Mm. type of that string arrangement that gives us an object what is that what is that string on its own system runtime system runtime introspective services marshal as attribute okay so this is going to do some sort of reflective technique I, I would think i would imagine what is all this going to give us slap those in oh What's happening? Oh, did I miss a colon here? No. I might be conflating things. There's a set item. It sets a variable to, oh, I need the, ah, <laughs> what's happening? I am Dumbo unmanaged type okay now these are being uh kind of prefixed with an at sign or the uh sorry the ampersand so i i wasn't positive about this to begin with i, I was like what is that ampersand doing like if i took this right here took this whole syntax and slapped it in it doesn't return anything out to me but uh, it noti I noticed that it was defining a variable, right? It, set, it used set item variable on that syntax. So if I took a look at variable, it looked like it actually defined that variable, even though it was already running in strings. So I, I started to think this ampersand is just like another like invoke expression <laughs> or it'll evaluate code, it'll eval that. Like it's trying to execute, please sub. So... We are continuing to run code through all of this. Now, I kind of want to know what this does. Not going to lie. So let's just send it, you know? <laughs> let's just let her rip. But it dies for the last line. Cannot convert the kernel 32 value of type system string to type system type. I'm surprised this actually worked all that well in Windows, but I guess it is just kind of defining variables. Actually, uh, what variables were defined there? ZNY, oops, sorry. I was bringing myself into the video by clicking and dragging OBS. ZNY is defined. We have more martial objects. Tests, of course, our favorite, LKHJ. Reg path is still in there, reg key name, everything that was defined. But Rohu is new, bit converter. Um, param we saw before, but KJQ and L7P, those are new. 
pulling an apto man. Uh, other oddball stuff. DQ54, as we saw. Reflection, calling conventions, assembly builder access. So building up the capability to do other spooky, scary stuff. Uh, it errored, though. So part of me wants to see, would that error on Windows? I'll go back here. Oh, PowerShell does weird things when it's not. Well, I'm not fully. I am fully maximized. What's going on? Let's just paste it in and let's see what we do. Ooh, 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 ooh. A lot of these are getting blocked by AMSI or that anti-malware scan interface. The script contains malicious content and has been blocked by our antivirus software. So part of me wonders if this thing is meant to be an AMSI bypass on its own. Like if we go back, oh shoot, I guess I never made a, a cleaned copy of this. I'll do stage five cleaned and control Z my way home. Uh, we'll, we'll go back to the original stage five before we started to, to clean it up. So this whole big thing, I wonder if that is meant to be an AMSI bypass kind of on its own. So I'll go back to uh, Windows here and AMSI is on. If I run an AMSI utils test string, it does get triggered and blocked. But if I paste all this in, I get the same error that I did in Linux. Cannot convert the kernel 32 value of the system. Now that's in the code. Like that is, that's literally what it was supposed to do. So <laughs> did it just fail when it detonated? Did this not actually get anywhere? I don't know. Uh, and I was thinking, uh, do I need to use, d does AMSI have to be off for this thing to work? So I jumped over to AMSI.fail. Uh, all credit and kudos to Flangvik for this. And you've seen it, I'm sure, a, a few times before. Flangvik is actually exceptional. He's a, I see him on Twitter and Twitch every now and again streaming and doing some cool C-sharp stuff. So let's see if that actually bypass AMSI, which it looked like it did. Now I can run that test proof of concept string without a problem. So anti-malware scanning your face is off. And if I were to go back and grab this big long syntax, does it work now? It's it's still a syntax error. I, I, I don't know what that was supposed to do or where that would have come from. Um, maybe if we were to drill into it more and more, we could make sense of it. But at this point, I think it's time we just kind of move on um, this looks like a test to determine the architecture it's checking out the size of an integer pointer which means okay is a memory address going to be four bytes or anything otherwise four bytes for 32 bit um, looks like eight bytes i think for 64 bit maybe i said that wrong i don't know i my mind just kind of fell apart at that moment uh, this is a beautiful try catch statement that does nothing <laughs> here in its wild it, it caught in the natural habitat double try catch statements completely wasting space <laughs> that's a good one oh i'm cleaning again and I, ne I need to be in my stage five clean file let's get back to uh let's get back to where the action's at now what are we doing uh we have some more variables being defined our path reg looks like it's replacing. Oh, is this doing something with the reg path variable? Puts it into our path. Our path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the original here. That's the kind of key that we were looking at. But body, I'm assuming, uh, looks like it puts together a mangled get item property reading from our path with reg key name, but that reg key name was never defined in this script. Again, that comes from our stage four, um, or it, it would have been, it would have been our stage three, right? Going back to stage three cleaned, we had reg and reg path and all of these in this param and full reg. Reg key name was never actually used in this snippet of PowerShell, but it will be used in the one that follows following those IEX. Uh, layers. So param is what it's calling? No, 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 no. It, it was a, uh, it was reg key name. Yeah, my face is in the way. Reg key name. 
So Reg key name is this G six F one jazz it. Um, and that guy's right here. Oh, that's a, that's a big one. That's a big fish. Is he the only one that spirals on to infinity? <laughs> oh, you love to see it. You love to see it. Ladies and gentlemen, what's this guy do? What are you? It doesn't immediately come across as a, um, let's, let's do this in cyber chef real quick. Just to, just to see if there's more we need to do with it. Maybe this program, maybe the script and PowerShell will do something else with it, but let's remove those quotes. Let's do a from base 64. Nothing really in that. Nothing really there. Not, not a DOS executable. Um, not a PE file or a windows program. We'll download it. So downloads, download dot dot into what was this thing called? A good old G6. Yeah, dude. Malware like a G6. <laughs> what are we doing? Okay. Now we got that file created. Um, and let's go back to what, let's see what the code does. Let's see if it does anything actually with this. Um, then where do we go? Function get win32 types. Oh, wow. What? Wait a second. What? Look at this segment here. Look at this stinking code. This is unruly. <laughs> that is insane. Is it's it's pulling together, it's carving out, it's building types that are known in like the Windows 32 API. Like a lot of these. Yeah. There's so many. That's for one thing, freaking cool. Uh, yeah, and pff, there we go. Now, then we're done. Hey, return, get Win32 types. Here you go. Have like half of the entire Win32 API at your disposal. And then we get constants. Um, will this work? Does, it, does this, this genuinely just carve it all out? Oh, this is just setting the values though, isn't it? Like if we paste this all in, I want my I want my Win32 constants now. Let's see what we look like. <laughs> I think that's cool. Not gonna lie. Even if it's just like, oh hey, we're setting up uh, the constants and the the values for oh execute read and execute read write. Um, but some mem commit stuff that that's just kind of cool in my opinion. Like building that all in into the the PowerShell script makes it even more powerful. As I've said before, uh, does the Win32 types one just go? Does that work? Trying this on Linux probably won't have the most leeway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty bloody. You cannot call a method on a null valued exception. Stop trying, you idiot. Let's do it on, let's do it on Windows. Let's see what we get. Oh, no. This is going to be a long time. Oh, it's actually cruising. It did it. Uh, what do our Win32 types look like, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> That's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. Not going to lie. And you, I'm sure you could like drill down into these even more. I'll use FL star. <laughs> Great, thanks. Pretty useless. Can I like index some of these? Or is there like, if I get member on everything, does it do it? Yeah. Note property runtime type. I'm sure, like, if subsystem type super smash brothers, yeah, okay. So, they're, they're just more objects and stuff you could deal with. That, that segment of code was huge, and I just kind of wanted to see what was up. So, forgive me, a little exploratory tangent as I tend to do. Um, and then we have a bunch of functions. The back ticks are in here again for some escape character sequences. Sub signed int 
as unsigned? Uh, yeah, that's what that says. Sub, sub signed int as unsigned, like subtract? Or substitute the numbers? Carry over? That's genuine math. That's math, guys. <laughs> and then it runs ls. Oh, ls on variable. It's value to n64. That's weird. Why would it do that? Why would it need to do that? Add signed int as unsigned. Okay. More math. <laughs> And yeah, defining variables to let this thing go. Cool. Compare val1 greater than val2 as you int. Unsigned in. Couple if statements in there. <laughs> Convert you int to int. Test memory range valid. Get agent head. Oh, no, 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 get, get image NT headers. Yeah, that makes the most sense to me. Um, put into use our good old Win32 types, everybody. <laughs> Go to the library, check out every single book they have. <laughs> get PE basic info, get PE data, detailed info. Uh, this is huge. I'm, I'm just cruising through it because I know we have a thousand lines to get through. Copy sections, update memory addresses. Oh, that actually sounds kind of bad. Sketchy. Now we're updating memory. So we are writing to memory. We are going to do some more reflection. Import DLL imports. Local get delegate type. Oh, we see get delegate type all the time. That's I just saw this. Wow. Wow. That's, uh, you can't plan for this, people. You, the show's not scripted. That's just the perfect place for uh, obfuscation to, to just, just cut stuff up. Invoke memory load library? What does that do? Invoke memory load library. Oh, that's a that's the end. That's like the bottom. That's the very end of the thing. It uses this IEX thing with the ampersand, right? Invoke. Uh, that's mangled with the format string, with the F string there. Invoke load library. Invoke load memory library. Yeah. With the body. With the with the with the registry value, but that's not an executable. What are they doing? Is it is it is just shell code? Is it not? It takes in PE bytes. Yeah. Gets our good old Win32 constants. Gets our Win32 types. Taking home the whole house. PE info. Get info. Get inf what? Get basic info. I'm assuming loader uh with some variables what is that actually trying to supply I, I, I generally can't make sense of that one so i just want to check child item oh duh come back come back sublime text thank you p handle starts at zero effective p handle zero what happened if you set a p handle to zero does it do something weird Variable virtual. Oh, stuff is going on in that. Let's let's word wrap this thing. Virtual alloc, the load address, the PE info, size of image constants, mem commit, constants, mem reserve, execute, read, write. Totally slapping some shell code in. Effective. EP P handle? P handle. Address add sign. 
Let's get let's get the word wrap back in here in this big thing to see what this actually is doing. Size of headers. It's running copy. So it's going to end up copying the payload. All the bytes from it. So it is totally going to do some shot work stuff. I'm assuming you're going to end up like calling write or create thread. Importing DLL in the copy sections though. Add update memory addresses. Update memory addresses. <laughs> I think. And where is it? Where's the stinking wait for single object? There it is. Create thread. Create thread right there. If you couldn't read that and wait for single object. So that's what that does. But what is this thing? That's our G6. Oh, get another directory, please. Uh, that's our G6, boy. It's data, though. It's not an executable. This is the same thing that we would have seen out of CyberChef. All right. Well... Um, I, I spent a few minutes just fumbling around in Ghidra to see if it does anything, but I, I didn't get a lot out of it. So, um, let's do what we always do. <laughs> let's do what makes everybody angry, but still always works like all the time. Let's look and see what, uh, let's see what gems this thing has, if it has anything. A lot of PPs in here. You know, thinking back, I, I really regret saying that. <laughs> now that I said it out loud, I don't, it, it just didn't, it really didn't sell the way I wanted it to. You know, maybe that didn't sound that good either. Uh, registry stuff, software, Microsoft, Windows NT current version with an endpoint and URL to reach back out to. Let's keep an eye on that. Let's see if we can reach out. Disable real-time monitoring. That's like, sh hmm, shut down Defender, please. <laughs> it's literally it. Software, Microsoft, Windows Defender, real-time protection. Just, yeah, just go home, Defender. Pack it up. Disable anti-spyware. Disable routinely taking action. No auto update. Oh, that's awesome. I, I would, uh, I should throw this thing in Ghidra, but we get we have all our answers right here. MSHTA for an HTA file again. And what are these huge amounts of IP addresses and domain? <laughs> like like uh, HTTP URLs to reach out to. Some HTTP, some to HTTPS. There are so many. Holy cow. <laughs> okay. Um config kill all kill stop resume modules update update interval there's a user agent in here there's a mozilla windows nt tried uh making a post request i'm assuming gathering information like the install date digital product id and there goes another round of a huge amount of <laughs> ip addresses <laughs> Scroll past right that. What do we got in here? 37. One, these are just kind of on their own, so they look a little weird. Unicode characters. Memset men copy. Internet crack URL. I've never heard of that. Is that is that genuinely an API call? I might be wrong. I mean it, it might it may very well be. I just have never heard of that. Internet crack. Okay, there's a lot of other stuff in here that is just seemingly API calls. Uh, oh. Okay, so I, I, I need to kind of lay my hand on the table. I need to lay the cards out in front. The original file that this came from, the .hta file that we this all started, uh, was in these user, poor Carrie, uh, in her app data roaming. And it had this username, uh, this file name, sorry, SUI6Q9ENNH. Uh, I want to keep track of that because it, I think that's useful as to what the original file name was. 
You know what? Let's actually go ahead and move the original wacko.hta to that original name kind of as it should have been. But that MSHTA is like the persistence for this thing. Like, I mean, th this is how it's going to end up kickstarting itself. And it was interesting to me that it already knew the like specific path for that, that user, for that individual user. And the same thing with the registry value. Like it already knew this binary, this shell code, whatever this was already had the context of, Hey, this is the registry key that we're using. This is the username that we're targeting. Uh, that was kind of neat in a weird way. Uh, but that's the end of the strings. So at this point, I think we have gotten the idea across that this is bad. <laughs> I think we can all agree that this is malicious at this point, but I do want to know what is this thing? Um, we want to give it our, our diagnosis, right? So let me take a look at these strings one more time. Those IP addresses might be kind of smoking guns. Maybe that's something we could we could latch on to to do a little bit of research, a little bit of detective work as to what really this thing is. Uh, oh, I don't really want to use strings if I want to copy all of those IP addresses. There's some here. Wait, those are present in this thing as well. This looks like a... Looks like a JSON object. Yeah. Um, I'm going to remove all of the commas and replace them with a new line. Um, there are a couple oddballs that have the beginning and ending uh, quote. So now let's remove all the commas and just delete them. Uh, and let's remove all the quotes. Okay. So now we have some indicators of compromise potentially or IP addresses or endpoints that this thing might call back out to. I'd love to see if any of these things still exist. And uh, don't you worry, everybody. I'm, I've got a VPN, I've got a little proxy. I'm, in, I'm, not, I'm inside a virtual machine. You and me, together? Are we here? No, no. Ringing the phone, but no one is picking up. Oh, sorry, that, that needs a curl. Also no answer on that one. Uh, the certificate might be being weird, maybe. No, all of these, all these don't seem to respond. What about these what about these guys down here? No route. No route. That bad request. Oh no no no. Does it need HTTPS? HTTPS, please. HTTPS. I genuinely haven't seen this. I, I gen this is I genuinely this is new. What is this? Oh no. Okay. We're kind of going into uncharted territory for the moment. So bear with me. This might be a long video. Let me save this to download.html. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Let's get a little Google Translate because I'm dumb. Slot machines. Bro, play for free. Play for free online and without registration. Is that so? Why is that so funny to me? That shouldn't be funny to me. Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. Is it doing is it doing anything weird in here? Maybe the JavaScript's kind of sketch. Oh, these are just for sliders though. These are, these might be from like 
Links back to itself. Um, I just want to know. I just want to know what all this says. Slot machines. So if you were to play slot machines, what would happen? I just, I just want to know. Oh, we got more stuff. We got more stuff. We got more stuff. There's a lot. Ooh. Online casinos have roulette wheels and poker and blackjack tables, but no gaming, no gambling club is unthinkable without slot machines. They invite gamers to the world of excitement who want to feel the adrenaline, try their luck, and win big. The first classic one, armed bandits appeared in the United States. <laughs> Armed bandits appeared in the United States 100 years ago. At the dawn of development, slot machines were mechanical, had three reels, and one pay line. Modern slot machines are more exciting for gamers' leisure, as they contain up to 40 active lines, bonus games, and the possibility of doubling prizes. You know, I think we really... Book of Raw. <laughs> I think we really doubled our prize here. I didn't expect to see this. This, this I'm having, I'm having fun with this. Demo game, Crazy Fruit, Crazy Fruit or R2, Crazy Fruits or R2, is that a thing? Is it like a well-known, oh, Aztec Empire, Fruit Cocktail, Crazy Monkey, Resident, The Money Game, Sharky, this is too, oh my god, I didn't even realize how long this file was, this, this page goes on forever. How many stinking slot machine games are there? <laughs> what can we play? Oh my goodness. I know we've left the realm of malware analysis at this point. The big bad wolf. But I'm, I'm just having fun, guys. You, you, you gotta let the boys play. I'm just having fun. Okay, uh... Scrolling down, I see comments. Block for installing meters keeps track of what you click with the counter. Um, live index, live internet, live internet, live internet. Are you? That's apparently a known thing. Uh, Crochet. Translate that page, please. One of the largest in the Russian internet blogging platform. Huh. Okay. Bulkin Nagangi site. We could have some fun um, looking at all of these different like IP addresses and kind of determining where they where they come from. And maybe that would be another great video. Uh, like having something to automate going through some of these would be kind of neat. Not gonna lie. Which which was the one that I just copied? One five six. Yeah, the one five six. That one's offline. Let's just see. Let's just see. My my curiosity is getting the better of me. 403 forbidden. I don't have permission to access that one. Uh, okay. We could, look, there are 146 in this list, so we could do this forever. I, I, I need to stop. I need to continue with the actual uh, video here. A lot of these seemingly are down, though, or, I, or I, I can't see them or access them myself. So there's that. Let's do some detective work at this point. Um, other than that fun frenzy that we just went down uh, looking at the slot machine site, I, I want to get an idea as to what this really is. So I'm gonna try and look for like malware samples that use these. 
or other indicators of compromise that might have talked about this before? Um, so I'm going to take a look at all of these links and kind of get see if I can find anything that might tell me more about this. Um, I'm on anyrun.net, anyrun any.run. Some zip file or something that seems to call back out to that 185 IP address. Another one on a different page, but that's kind of it. Ooh. This one has strings that contain that this program cannot be run in DOS mode. Like it actually has a header here, a PE header for an actual executable. And it has the same start of strings that we had seen between the current version, getting Defender, disable real-time monitoring, showing one to 10 of 228 entries. Are there like more of these? Oh, yeah. Oh, this does more though. This has like a PowerShell port of it, but it does have all of these Defender shutdown things. Oh no, that has that too. That has the ACL and a, the big dump of IP addresses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is this thing though? Does it have a name? Has this been diagnosed? What do you got? Joe Sandbox typically has some really good info. Um, this is a codex file though. Is there a variant as to how this has kind of been found? Detection threshold score 100, range 100 reporting whitelisted threat. Novter? Malicious. I think that's, I think that's right. That's on the money guys. You rolled the slot machines, you let it go. And I think you were right. This is a cool chart. Evader, exploiter, Trojan and bot. Yeah. Let me full screen this. That's cool. That's super cool. HTTP servers contact by the, by the sample do not answer. Likely the sample is an old dropper, which does no longer work. Uh, some, I, I really couldn't get a call back, but the slot machine. <laughs> sample monitors window changes or starting applications. Analyze the sample with simulates keyboard and key changes cookbook. Huh. Breakdown of the MITRE attack framework stuff that it does, signature overview, networking, etc. stuff that we'd kind of already seen. What else you got for me? These IP addresses, are there? There's the same one that we had searched for. Virus total triggers on that. Joe Security Novter. Yard detected Novter bot. And this is an example of an EXE. Is that thing? Oh, they have like a, they have a little like demo, like area you could look in. Oh, geez, sorry. I scrolled down. But you could like, you could watch it. You could play through um, what happens when the machine is dead or the, the malware is kind of detonated. So reaches out for some that IP address that we saw a moment ago. Obviously, I don't think there's going to be a lot that really changes on the screen in this case. It's going to be silent. No created or dropped files. Contacted some domains over in the Netherlands. Switzerland. That's crazy. Oh, this is the report that it displayed. And this is back to my NRU. Yeah, here's the report that it generated. Are there other IP addresses that will get me anything? Like what about these ones down here? These ones that were kind of out all on their own? I just want to see. I might search for like malware or indicators of compromise. Joe Sandbox again, what is this? Novter malware. 
It's saying Navjur again. Translate this page. Yeah, bring that to English for me, please. Research by Trend Micro has discovered a new modular botnet malware called Navjur that uses the Covjur botnet malware to be distributed via malvertising in his exploit kits. Ah. The attacks are social engineering since they lead the internet user to download a software package necessary to update this outdated Adobe Flash application from an infected website. However, instead of updating said software, it drops a malicious HTML application file .hta. Victim executes this file and it can grab another PowerShell payload. Once PowerShell script is run, it disables Windows Defender. Yeah, yeah. And Windows update it processes. The malware executes shell code to bypass user account control. Ooh. Downloads multiple JS. So, wow. Okay, these are the IP addresses that it kind of detected. Novter. That's totally the thing. What else we got? Back in 2019. Okay. Trend Micro. We found a new modular modulus modular fileless botnet malware, which we named Novter, that the CovG core campaign has been distributing. We've been actively monitoring this threat since its emergence and early development and saw it being frequently updated. We found a new modular fileless botnet, also called Notersock and Divergent. Like the movie. I'm just kidding. Covder has been involved in... Yeah, Covder is huge, for one thing. I know Covder is has wreaked havoc like crazy. But Novter is around. Oh, there's a tech notes briefing. Let's check a look at that. Yeah. HTA file launches PowerShell, receives commands and downloads commands. Attack chain. Malicious HTMA file. Okay. Runs a PowerShell script that appears to take inspiration from the open source Invoke PS Inject project. Take a look at that. Ooh, this is part of Empire. Ooh, this must be that uh, Invoke like memory load library. Does this have a bunch of those like Win32 constants and like Win32 types in here? Does it, does it like build those out too? <laughs> Win32 stuff. Get Win32 types. And it just, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. It's different syntax, right? But it's the same idea. Like, it's the same process of kind of gathering all that information so you could use it. And there's just tons of this. Wow. Get Win32 constants. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So ours was a little bit more obfuscated. Ours is doing something different, but pulls in those functions that it needs. And of course, I'm sure it'll do like some load library thing. Helpers. Subsigned int is unsigned. Add signed int is unsigned. It's absolutely power. Yeah. Same exact function names convert you into you and get hex is new. Test memory range valid. Write bytes to memory. Get delegate type. Get proc address. Enable SE debug privilege. Doing some like impersonation stuff, maybe. Image headers. Get basic p info. Okay, so this is some stuff we've already seen. Aspects of this aren't in here, but others are. Is the last thing this does like load in a library? or inject something. I mean, obviously it's gonna be invoke PS inject, so. That's craziness. That's crazy cool. I'm done scrolling through that. What else do we have? We have the report that I kinda of wanna look through, but PowerShell script will in turn disable Windows Defender, Windows Update, yep. PowerShell script is also embedded with Nubter, which will be executed filelessly via the PowerShell reflection technique. The backdoor commands that Nubter supports are kill all, kill, stop, resume, modules, updates. Yeah. Those are the exact same ones that we saw, even in just a cursory strings. Wow. 
This is definitely it. This is absolutely it. Nodster. That must be comms. Yeah. Quick cursorily looking through this. Wow. I want to look at that technical brief. Oh, they have uh, indicators of compromise. Let me look at that too. These are some of the JS JavaScript stuff. Yeah. The IP addresses we've seen. Some specific files that they would have called back. IP addresses related. Yep. Same thing. What do we got in this? This should probably be this is likely telling us the same thing. So this is different, um, like syntax. But if if those were the research, if that's the research that was done back in 2019, now there might be some variations, like a different version of what's going on. And yeah, see, they they look like they were able to kind of examine this code very well. But maybe they had an executable specifically, not just the. It sets persistence to the following: dropping a randomly named HTA file to app data roaming where the routine body contains a hard-coded string with the HTA file contents of percent markers, which are replaced with randomly generated strings at runtime. This HTA file contains JavaScript code, yes, which reads and executes a PowerShell payload from registry, yes. <laughs> Creating three randomly named registry subkeys, yeah. A oh, little typo here, guys. A little soft aware, Trend Micro. Giving you a heads up, I'm gonna submit a pull request, Hacktober. Fix your typos. <laughs> the first two registry subkeys have hard-coded templates in the malware body. Yeah. Yep. And invoke PS inject. Exact same setup and code. That's really cool. And this is a really this is a really good like briefing. You can see the ACL, ACCL JSON format. Wow. Those are the commands for the modules, the backdoor commands they run. Wow. Wow. I think that's it. I think that's all I can cram into my mind right now. <laughs> that I thought that one was, was quite a ride to dig through. And uh, I love the surprise from one of those machines calling back that was like, yeah, Play some slots. Let's do some gambling. <laughs> cool. I think that's it, everybody. I think that's all I can offer for this video. But I hope you had fun. I hope you really enjoyed this deep dive, looking through some syntax, traversing through JScript and JavaScript to PowerShell, uh, and Googling around, doing our research, hunting. And that's, that's the fun stuff. So I think we'll wrap it up. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. I know this was a longer video than most in the kind of this little malware analysis thing, the series that we ended up doing, but I, I, I had a lot of fun. I hope you did too. And that's it. I, I'm not going to say the same thing over and over again anymore. <laughs> I'm done. It's the end of the video, everybody. Thank you so, so much for watching. If you did enjoy this video, please do all those YouTube algorithm things. Please like the video. Maybe leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. Write an F in the chat to call back to the very beginning of the video. F in the comment section. Maybe subscribe. You know, I'd be super happy to do it. I, I'd love to see that. Thank you. And um, that's it. I'll see you in the next video, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. I love you. Take care. Bye now.